So this signal's been red for a while, but I'm about to pull some Harry Potter level magic. Lumos I get a green and away I go. That's pretty cool. Of course, we live in a world of science and not a world of magic. So I wanted to know, how does that work? Have you ever pulled up to a red light and you've looked down at the asphalt and seen that somebody's come and cut circles? Or looked up at the crossbar that the traffic signal's mounted on and seen junk mounted up there, plastic boxes and enough cameras to make a conspiracy theorist go crazy? Those are the three ways the traffic signal, like a Jedi, can sense your car's presence. And I wanted to know, how do those things work? I'm Brian Gerardo. I'm the Western Sales Director for iTerrace. Hello, my name is Mohammed. I'm the room and I work for Caltrans. Manufacturing uh, above ground sensors, video detection specifically. Responsible for Riverside County Mobility System. It's Mohammed's job to take equipment and use it to solve one of the hundreds of traffic causing scenarios we face every time we drive. Here's an example. You have a very busy street which travels east and west. A small neighborhood street travels north and south. They meet at a traffic signal. There's only so much green light time to give. How much should each street get? You could set it 50-50, which sounds fair, but it's really inefficient for the big street. There's a lot of wasted time that the small street doesn't use. You could give almost all the green light time to the big street. But drivers leaving the neighborhood on the small street would have to wait a long time for their green light. You can solve this problem with a detector. An electronic button which senses your car and tells the traffic signal, Hi, I'm here. Give the side street a green light as soon as you can. There are three main components which a traffic signal uses to detect your car. The detector, that's a piece of hardware that electrically changes when it senses your car nearby. A signal processor, electronics that relay that small electronic change into something useful, and the traffic signal controller, the big piece of equipment that literally decides which light bulbs to turn red, yellow, or green. The history of detection is almost as old as the history of the traffic signal. The first automated stoplights used timers. By the 1930s and 40s, the General Electric Company wanted to make a way for cars on small side streets to change the light a pressure plate, a piece of metal where the tire rolls over it and it goes down so it creates pressure that creates a contact closure to the controller to say there's a car there. There were magnetometers, just big magnets in the ground, and then there were pneumatic tubes as we used to ride through gas stations. They put a bell off on the gas station on the roadway. You can still see these. From time to time, engineers place them on the street to count cars. Well, technically they count axles. Each time a wheel drives over the hose, it presses air into the counting device. Some traffic signals of the 1950s used this same technology, but all it would take is a little hole in the hose and the air would leak out and not go in the counter like it's supposed to. Engineers wanted something better. We use loops. Loops are definitely uh, very reliable. You take a copper coil, put it under the ground, wind it around a few times, and then you connect it to a device that measures the change of the magnetic field within that copper coil. They create a field that is disrupted by a vehicle that passes over them or sits on top of them. This was the hot new technology of the 60s. No more broken hoses, just a simple coil of wire, which through the magic of electronics, could sense an electromagnetic disturbance in the force. It is shallow within three inches, uh, three inches below the surface, covered also with epoxy. But sometimes we come over that and we do a, a pavement overlay. The thicker the overlay, obviously, the, the, the less effective the detection is. If you're an electricity nerd or took any physics, bear with me for a minute. You may have seen back in like eighth grade science fair projects, somebody taking a coil of wire be wound more tightly than this, putting a nine volt battery on it and using it as an electromagnet to pick up metal objects. Well, the opposite of that is an inducer. When a metal object passes over a coil of wire, it produces a little bit of electricity. It's, it's quite a bit more complicated than that. But let's pretend for a minute that this is our coil of wire for our loop detector, and we'll bury it in the ground a couple inches right there at the stop bar. Now, a real loop detector is measured in something like 
Henry's. I never learned what a Henry was. That was fourth floor stuff. I took classes down in the basement. But my meter does have volts in AC, which we'll flip to here. And we're going to hook up each end of this to the probes. And as you can see, there's a tiny bit of AC voltage there, but it's pretty negligible. Now, let's pretend that I'm driving my sports car up to this light and I want it to trip. Now, this car doesn't really have much metal in it, and because I can't measure in Henry's, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to use this refrigerator magnet. And as my car passes over the coil of wire, look at that. It makes an itty bitty little bit of difference on the multimeter. That little tiny bit of voltage difference is enough for the signal processor to be able to tell the stoplight computer that a car has pulled up over the loop. That's the biggest advantage of loops. They are so reliable. For a long time, we chose only those because of the reliability of that. Loops were Superman, with powers and ability far beyond those of pneumatic tubes and pressure plates. Loops changed the course of vehicle detection during the 70s, 80s, and 90s and into this century. And they're not just big here in California. You look around your region, you're going to see them too. But of course, being able to see them is also sort of their kryptonite. The only problems or, uh, with loops that we have are when we uh, disturb the, the pavement. Sometimes before we do the overlay, the pavement is grinded. With big heavy equipment, you know, they just chew up the loops, so to speak, and we'll have to recut them. <laughs> this is what happens in, in construction. Having to replace copper wire isn't really that expensive. It's the labor of sending out asphalt technicians to recut the loops and have your signal technicians inspect the work they're doing, making sure that the epoxy's put in properly so that water doesn't get into the loops. Because if you get water in the road, it can wash away the soil underneath the asphalt, and that creates all sorts of problems. I thought it was absolutely ridiculous for anyone to to take an um, axe or a saw and destroy beautiful new pavement. The pavement is the heart of the action and where a lot of wear and tear happens. Some engineers, researchers, and traffic signal vendor companies started exploring ways to move the detector anyplace else. In the late 80s, people were experimenting with lasers. People were experimenting with uh, the light in the mirror, you know, the thing that you walk into the liquor store with that makes the bell go off. Video detection uh, came out of some Defense Department studies. Uh, the F-14 Tomcat had a passive targeting system that used a camera, dark movement against the blue sky. That technology was then transferred after the Gulf War during the peace dividend to traffic signals, and that's the beginning of video detection. Uh, there were some very famous companies involved. One was Rockwell, a defense contractor, a very famous algorithm shop uh, called Sarnoff, Odetics or Iteris, obviously. Researchers had to rely on the video processing technology of the 1990s. Wow. In the very beginning, it was just the grayscale changes in the pixels. And that's why majority of your cameras, were, well, all of them in the beginning were black and white. Video detection actually has been there for a long time now. Those first 10 years were, were very, very difficult. When I saw the first one, I thought, oh my gosh. We detected absolutely everything but an automobile. Shadows, we would detect wind, we would detect dust. One frame per second image and the promise was there, the performance was not there unless you had beautiful conditions. I mean, beautiful Orange County conditions. Video processing improved with each decade. Just look at how video games changed. The improvement of processing power, it has a huge effect, the processing and the algorithms. The, the computer chips today are vastly superior. It's, it's like a century difference. Have you ever noticed when you visit another state, all of them, except here in California, have this little saying? and everybody assumes that it's a unique saying for their state, and that's just not true. I've heard it in half the country. Okay, you wanna know what it is? Here it goes. <clears throat> the thing about Insert place name here. Is that if you don't like the weather, you just wait 15 minutes. It's such a bad saying. Mother Nature and traffic signal components uh, don't like each other. Central Valley of California, we get a lot of fog. 
And the joke used to be the Central Valley of California is where you send video to die because of all the fog. When it's foggy, when the sun is shining straight into the, the, the camera, obviously, you know, then the detection is bad. One of the tricks is to put the camera up high and then point it down toward the ground. We do not want the horizon in our image. And we point down at an angle that eliminates as much as possible looking into the sun. Heaters can clear off ice, which builds up on the lens during the winter. As for dust, sleet, and snowstorms, Brian tells me the tech industry is making huge improvements in digital cameras, especially in the past few years, and their company is taking advantage of that. Our algorithms using our uh, wide dynamic range um, camera algorithms, if we can see it, we can detect it. If you're ever on a, a super foggy day, take your iPhone or your smartphone and open the camera and find an object that you know is there and you can't see, you put your smartphone camera to it, and I don't know how this happens, I can see the object through the camera. Somehow, digital imaging processing today sees through fog a ton better than the human eye. This may also help traffic signals become better at seeing your bicycle. Now, with, with what we can do with a video image, I can tell you everything that's happening. A bicycle from a motorcycle, from a pedestrian, from a car. The state of California mandate that bicycles must be timed or detected in every lane of travel. And I can take that information and put separate information to the traffic signal controller of different items in the intersection. One of the uh, advantages of uh, video detection is to detect those smaller uh, moving, quote unquote, uh, targets. Video is better at doing that. In fairness, so this doesn't become an unpaid commercial for cameras, loops can also detect a bicycle if it's done right. An engineer has to use real finesse to make a loop sensitive enough to pick up an object with one one hundredth the mass of your big metal car. When we have the loops, we actually put in a different loop, a wider loop to catch the bicycles and the motorcycles. We have to test it and keep it tuned, sensitive enough to pick up those smaller moving targets. Majority of the bicycles on the roadway being carbon fiber, the old style inductive loop needs to be very sensitive to pick up the itsy bitsy bit of metal or ferrous metal um, on the bicycle. And then they tune the frequency up and not only can it maybe detect that bike, but it's detecting the semi truck two miles away. And it's not the loop's fault, but most good bicyclists are investing in a really good bike. And a good bike or a great bike is really all carbon fiber. One of these avid bikers gets elected to your city council, convinces the council to add a bike lane. The road crews come out and restripe the lines, and now none of the loops line up anymore. We move a lane, we restripe or whatever, then those loops are disturbed and it obviously uh, need to be recut. I have to disconnect all of the loop detectors. I've got to grind the pavement to grind the existing cable out because I can't put wires on top of wires. To install or repair a broken loop, crews have to close a substantial amount of the road sometimes multiple lanes, since it makes sense to work on multiple loops at the same time. Cameras also require a road closure for a new install, for cleaning, servicing, or replacing. But since there's only one camera for each side of the intersection, I watched one guy close off one lane using one bucket truck. So the disruption was quite a bit less. That's a big advantage that the video detection has on loops. Uh, you can recreate the zones of detection very, uh, very fast uh, within, within seconds. Because you're not cutting the roadway and we're just putting a camera up and looking down and I don't have to do any rewiring in my traffic signal cap. I can just go in, mouse and monitor, grab my zone, move it over, point, click and save. I can see why Brian is a sales director by the end of our Zoom call. I was ready to buy a camera, even though I don't own a traffic light. You have to consider everything and not just the price of a loop. You know, the people that, that are necessary to put them in the ground, the, the lane closures, and all that. So I reached out to some engineer friends I know, they're not involved with the story at all, and asked them, what's the deal? And they said, look, loops are still really good. We've been using them for 50 years. We'll probably use them another 50 years. And cameras are also getting quite good and coming down in price as well. 
But just because a camera is mounted up on a pole doesn't mean it's completely trouble free. They've seen some situations where the power line fell and hit the uh, metal of the traffic light and blew out the back end of the camera. So uh, it's no longer actually a, a price thing, but it's really uh, uh, weighing in th those advantages and disadvantages. That's why we have a choice of, of using either or, depending on the geometrics of the intersection. It just depends on what you need, when you need it, where you need it. And one of the things I find interesting is that a traffic light can mix and match. Signal detectors are just buttons, and you can have different kinds of buttons in the same light. And so some lanes will use loops, and some lanes and bicyclists will use cameras. And I suppose that's the correct answer. They're both great tools, and you use the right tool in the place you need it. A big thank you to Mohammed Bendel, home of Caltrans, and Brian Girardo of Terrace. And thank you to Tyler T. on Twitter, who tweeted at RoadGuyRob this very question and set the entire video in motion. Patreon and subscribe links below, which I certainly appreciate. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video.